Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Bruce Harrell. I'm chair of the Public Safety, Civil Rights, and Technology Committee. Today's Wednesday, April 16th. We're here for our regularly scheduled 2 o'clock meeting. I want to make a few brief announcements before we move into public comment. We have 11 agenda items uh, this afternoon. We'll be joined briefly or shortly uh, uh, by uh, Council Members Nick Lacott and Sally Bagshaw. I just told they had a, a slight conflict. Uh, on Wednesday, May 7th at 5.30, we'll have a special Public Safety, uh, Civil Rights and Technology Committee in Southeast Se Seattle Senior Center, that's off of South Holly. And there we'll be sort of focusing on many of the issues that have happened around Southeast Seattle. There's been some incidents of violence near South Shore School, around the light rail stations. And so there we're going to go over a lot of crime statistics and resource analysis with the public. Uh, we'll have several folks there. Uh, we'll have the uh, chief of police and the captain of that precinct out there, along with the South Community Police Team. We'll have Melissa Chen, the Southwest Liaison Attorney for that area, Mark Solomon, the Southwest Precinct Crime Prevention uh, Coordinator. We'll have Sound Transit Security folks there to have a coordinated effort, both with Sound Transit Security and our police department. I did want to announce on our chief of police search, I serve on that committee of 12 looking for the right person. We will be interviewing candidates the week of April 21st, 22nd, 23rd. Uh, we will submit to the mayor hopefully a final three folks on the week of May 12th. And hopefully May 19th, if things go well, the mayor will announce his nominee to the council. And then in May, early June, the council will consider acting on that selection. Just want to give folks an update there. And on April 22nd, Tuesday at 5.30, another evening meeting here in the chambers, we'll have a public hearing on Seattle's police accountability system. And there uh, we'll have a joint meeting joint public hearing with the City Council and the Office of Professional Account Accountability Review Board, otherwise known as OPARB. And there we will listen to comment on police accountability system and listening, listening to concerns of the community as we enter into negotiations with the Seattle Police Officers Guild, SPOG, um, for the upcoming year. Okay, let's move into public comment before we get into our Seattle Police Department's May Day report, and we have Four people, I believe, signed up. I'll read you off in the order that I have signed up. We have, yes, uh, Mr. Dennis Saxon, followed by Phil Moser, Mosek, Mochek. Sorry about that. Hi, Dennis. Hi, I'm Dennis Saxman. I just wanted to give you a few more data points for the Office of Civil Rights issue on the agenda. I have a complaint that I've appealed of theirs, a decision of theirs that I've appealed to the Seattle Human Rights Commission. And I wanted to tell you my experience. I uh, had filed a, an appeal, a complaint based on discrimination um, uh, by my landlord. And when I talked with HUD uh, quite a while ago, the person with HUD said, man, it sounds like they're harassing you. You should file a civil rights complaint. So I called the Office of Civil Rights, and the woman on the phone was very quick, very abrupt. She told me um, she didn't have a lot of time, that they got thousands of complaints a week or a month. I can't remember what she said, but they obviously, from the statistics, do not get thousands of complaints a week or a month. But that's what she told me, and she seemed to be t uh, functioning as judge and executioner and interviewer at the same time. And she told me basically, you know, she didn't think I had any cause for complaint. So I let that ride for a while, and then I ran into Julie Nelson, and uh, Julie Nelson suggested I contact Mike Chin, which I did. Didn't receive much more satisfaction, so Julie finally said to send a letter to her, which I did. It was a 17-page letter, very detailed documentation of two years of what I considered to be harassment and discrimination. And um, the office really whittled my complaint down. They appeared to spend a total of 10 minutes interviewing my landlord over the phone. 
So how did they judge credibility and everything? And I just wanted to let you know that they'll probably be telling you a lot of happy stories. And um, I don't think their process is the way it's represented. And I encourage you to look at the earlier audit report on their appeals procedure also. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Phil Mocek, followed by Sam Bellamino. Bellamino. Hi, my name's Phil Mosek. I live in Seattle, and I work a few blocks from here. And for the last few years, uh, on International Workers' Day, also known as May Day, I've taken uh, off work a couple hours early to go walk around with my camera and observe and document the actions of the activities happening downtown. And I've also I've read the police department's incident action plans and the commander's after action reports, and I've listened to police radio, and I've looked at videos. I have a pretty good sense of, of how things go. And what I've seen on, on the scene were thousands of people uh, and hundreds of police officers, thousands of people demonstrating, hundreds of police officers policing the demonstrations, and a small fraction of each of those groups looking to pick a fight, it seems. And uh, I'm concerned that one group uh, uh, picking a fight carry a lot of weapons. And our police officers are, are trained to deal with these stressful situations. They should be able to police these events without blowing their tops. Uh, what I would really encourage you to find out from the reporting today is of the people on whom the police used chemical weapons and explosives, because I, I did see this happen, uh, of those people, how many of them were arrested for the incredible wrongdoing that led the police to use weapons on them? And of those people who were arrested, how many of them were found guilty by a court? And if the police department do not have these stats for you, I think you should consider that you're uh, being misled, because they should know that this is going to be of interest during this meeting. Thanks. Thank you. Mr. Bellamil, followed by Mr. Alex Zimmerman. Hi, my fear. Hi, my fear. Hi, my fear, Harold. You know, we have a system in place now that helps you stay in power, that helps abuse happen within our community. You have the police department coming and sitting with you and speaking and telling you, we're the citizens. Last year, you had a meeting, the civil rights meeting on May Day. You could have had protesters come in and sit with you and speak with you. You didn't do it. Why? Why did the police only get to sit there and speak to you? Why are the citizens not allowed in the dialogue? Phil had very good points, and I hope you ask and drill, not just the surface questions, but really dive in to get answers. Probably won't do it, but I hope you will, because we have a system in place. You know, I wish I had pulled the article up. Princeton University came up with who, who, um, who directs policy in uh, America, and it says uh, public has a minuscule, near zero, statistically non-significant impact on public po policy compared to the wealthy. You should look up this article. CNN International has it. RT has it. Who controls policy? Interest groups come in and persuade you, get you elected. The wealthy persuade you, influences you, get you elected. Citizens get beat up in the streets while protesting, doing their First Amendment right, and who gets to sit at that table? Not the citizens. The interest group, the police. They're your interest groups. They're your arm. You're literally abusing the citizens without... <laughs> you are the Fuhrer. You're a totalitarian government with nine separate bodies up here enslaving us. Hi, Fuhrer. Is there a conversation over there that needs to happen at the moment that citizens are up here speaking? It's called an A-B conversation. What's it, what? A-B conversation. What's that mean? I mean, it's between A and B, so don't worry about it. <laughs> oh, back. so you're going to speak during a time of citizens is up here engaging up? you. Okay, your time is up, Mr. Bellamy. So the problem is, is that you're having a conversation while citizens are uh, giving you discussion. Your time is up, sir. Further showing, for, I just want to say, further showing your time that is up. citizens don't have input, only the wealthy do, because you don't talk when they're talking. Thank you, Mr. Bellamy. Oh, Mr. Zimmerman, you're next. I'm Alex Zimmerman, and I'm president of Stand Up America. Um, yeah, guys, you are a gangster, you are a bandita, you are a Nazi democratic mafia. So, my compliment to you. Hi, Führer Harrell. Hi, Führer Lekata. Hi, Führer Baksha. 
and have fewer burgers. You know, you guys have been doing that for the last couple of weeks. You're going to come up. Exactly. You here. did this. You Go did ahead. this new policy, what is make right now constitution, brand new American constitution in this room. Nobody did this. No poor Nazi, no poor Soviet Union communists, no Chinese. You did because it's enterprise. In America, you can do in everything. No matter what this degree of freaking idiot you are. I make a new rules, a new constitution. Hair. And take me out for 28 days. Guys, you understand about you're talking? You are talking about your mental condition. You mentally sick people. You are psychopath. It's exactly what has ha happened. I cannot ever tell you you are a Nazi or terrorist or something similar to this because you are mentally sick. I bring in this room, only in this room. In chamber room, you know what does mean? New constitution. Guys, come on. Who are you? I just don't have a sense. You are a freaking idiot. You degenerate idiot. You are a psychopath. Is you start doing this? Take me out for 28 days. No court, no trespass, no policeman, nothing. No more American constitution, no more state constitution, no more amendment. We have a council who can do in everything. God bless America. God bless America. It's exactly what has happened because you are a freaking idiot, a mentally sick psychopath. You place in mental institution, no hair. We were new constitution, what is you bring in exactly in committee like this. With public say it's a real right. It's a beautiful new constitution. Freaking idiot. Thank you, Mr. Zimmerman. Appreciate the compliments. Uh, Mr. Ms. We had one we had one speaker that wanted to be had on, Ms. Paula Rivera. Is, is your, is it, uh, stop, start the clock over. Is that okay? There you go. Thank you for the opportunity to speak, and I'm glad Chief Bailey is here. Uh, basically, what we're, we're seeing and relating back to the last May Day, which I saw on the news, basically, what you're dealing with is a, a cult um, that actually orchestrates all the crimes that the police have to deal with. And then they mix it in with just honest protesters, and then the protesters are blamed. And they're called Dope Inc., and they make seven billion a year, and they do all the crimes on the planet. And unfortunately, I've been running into a lot of them. So here's the story. It's a war of manipulation. The battlefield is the state of Washington, because we have the strongest constitution. They're using and abusing the police and the fire. And no one's seen the damn truth yet, because most of it's been disappeared. And I've made multitude of attempts, and I know that the police have too. And I can explain all this, all this task forces that uh, are in parallel with a whole bunch of crises are because these guys are order out of chaos. They create the chaos and distract the police with bombings and all kinds of stuff. So, um, which even ties into the Patriot disaster last year because I had help during the first 14 days here. And uh, they wanted to be able to shut down the streets so there'd be no parking. And they control everything with parking and lights. And it's a se severe abuse of power. And the evidence I have, no one has. Thank you. Um, so there's really no time left, because what they're doing is a parallel path of good and evil. And what they've been doing is actually doing using the police help and what they'll do is they'll make sure no one ever sees my evidence. And they use federal surveilling for 90 days. And then they follow up with a 21-day thing. And it's 111, which they love that number over and over. And I could show all the ups and downs in the stock market are related to what I, what the evidence I have is, and my success. And uh, roughly an hour, I could give you just a bit. Please consider it while the chief is here. I'll wait. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Revere. Uh, are there any other members of the public who would like to testify during our public hearing portion, public comment portion? Hearing none, I will close public comment. Thank you very much. And we'll move into our first agenda item. I'd ask that all the presenters come forward to the table. And Ms. Samuels, why don't you read the next matter into the agenda? Seattle Police Department's May Day Briefing.
Good afternoon. Why don't we just start off some name introductions first? Good afternoon. I'm Harry Bailey. I'm from Chief of Police. Chris Fowler, the commander Thank of the you. West Precinct. Barb Graff, director of emergency management. Okay. Thanks for being here this afternoon. And um, what I thought we'd do this afternoon is you sort of prevented uh, Chief and sort of an out outline in, in the binder of sort of the general plan. We fully recognize there may be certain tactics or plans that are not to be disclosed to the public, so we want to respect that. But perhaps you can just uh, explain to us sort of what the city does to prepare, what some of the lessons learned were in the past, and sort of walk us through what we may expect here. And we've been joined by Councilmember Nick Licata. Thank you. Well, this year again, we uh, have Captain Chris Fowler as the incident commander for the May Day event, and he will be reporting to Assistant Chief uh, Paul McDonough, who unfortunately couldn't be here today because of a death in his family. Uh, this planning has been going on, as you know, for uh, over a year now. And what we've done uh, in the planning is, is that we've looked at our 2013 after action report and took the recommendations from there to, to start this process along with uh, the recommendations in the, even in that 2013 report was uh, recommendations from the Hillman report. Uh, along with working with our Compliance Bureau to make sure that uh, we are covering everything that uh, was agreed upon in the settlement agreement with the DOJ. Uh, we have already started a number of things in contacting the business uh, owners both in uh, downtown Seattle and the East Precinct to make sure that uh, we are able to make contact with them. Certainly we've done outreach to the organizers themselves for the immigration march. And finally, we've been working closely with the uh, law department to make sure that uh, all of our actions and uh, proposals are, are legal. Uh, with that, I'm, I have two other people here, Captain Fowler and Barb Graff. And uh, since Captain Fowler is the incident commander, I'm going to let him take it over at this point. And Captain Fowler, can you sort of describe uh, what, it, what is an incident commander? What's sort of his or her responsibilities, or how does that play out just from a practical standpoint? Sure. The incident commander is selected by the chief of police to actually command the incident. And it isn't just the incident, but it's the planning. So we get involved very early in the planning process to provide some overall objectives that have been proved, approved by the chiefs uh, with our um, operations section to work on planning and, and uh, determine uh, what the goals of the organization are. So we work through all that. And then the day of the event, we're in command at that point. Okay. Were there other prepared comments you were going to make, I think? Uh, if you have any questions, I can certainly answer them concerning our objectives or what we plan on doing that day. So, um, I have a few questions, um, but I didn't want to interrupt your no, natural no. Public presentation. <laughs> um, I'll address something that was brought up in public testimony, and that was um, in recent years when we've had to use uh, the pepper spray <clears throat> or any form of chemical weapons that you know, that's sort of a, a rule of last resort. We, we, we hopefully we will not have to use any. But what kind of follow-up do we do in terms of looking at who was prosecuted for crimes? And, um, and again, I know we've done outreach uh, with some of those folks, and many of them were not anarchists. So do we do follow-up work with our assistant, uh, with our city attorney to get some intel on how we can improve things? Can you sort of walk us through that, that issue? Sure, and if I, if I could step back just one second, uh, concerning the use of pepper spray and, um, and the other uh, <coughs> devices, it, we noticed from 2012 to 2013 that, that clear expectations from the officer level was absolutely mandatory. So one of the things we did, and I did as the incident commander last year, was stipulate that uh, we never preclude an officer's individual use of um, force uh, to uh, protect themselves or citizens or prevent crimes. So that's always a condition. Uh, but in uh, large operations like this, we hold the control of the deployment of those devices at my level if we have to uh, do that as a planned response to a riot situation, which is what we saw in 2013, and that worked very well. And so those are the two conditions for the use of, uh, as you mentioned, OC, is that, again, an officer can use it uh, per our existing policies with use of force, or it's controlled at my level um, if we have to do it in a large-scale operation. Uh, as far as when we deploy it, um, for this incident, much like 2013, the goals are we certainly want to provide an opportunity for everybody to express their constitutionally protected First Amendment rights. 
Uh, but once crimes are committed, either crimes of violence or excessive property damage, then we'll make individual arrests uh, if we can. Uh, what we saw last year was that a large crowd turned riotous and in order to protect people who wanted to exercise those free speech rights, as well as the officers, uh, it became a, a controlled operation to attempt to mitigate some of those things, and that's when we used OC. Uh, of course, we'll always work with um, the prosecutor's office and anybody else on the arrests that we did make uh, to put together legitimate and reasonable cases. Uh, to go forward, which is uh, what we did last year. And we'll do that again this year. So <clears throat> just in terms of uh, to, to explain to a, a lay person, let's say the three of us are, are anarchists and we're, we've crossed the line to where you think pepper spray should be lawfully used and we're, we're doing some bad things. But then this fourth person is just standing by this person. This person shouldn't be there, but they're standing there. Uh, and this person could either inadvertently be confused as, a, as, as one of us. So how, how do the officers sort of navigate through that? Because this person, again, one could argue he still has a right to be around where this bad action is. Uh, maybe walk us through it, because I think that's where the problem lies, is that this person just happens to be a Sunday school teacher, and these three here are anarchists, but the Sunday school teacher just got not all anarchists um, are bad. Uh, pepper spray. Sure, and, and there's something I didn't. I thought I. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Why are you just saying anarchists? There's other groups out there. Sure, that's always a challenge. Um, we mitigate that in several ways. First, before there's any deployment or a reaction to a riot situation, there's warnings given to the crowd, and we do that several times. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that um, if it's not stopped or uh, the crowd doesn't move back into a, a peaceful type of situation, uh, then the warnings are given that we have to do this to, again, protect the public, protect property, and protect the officers. So that's the first step we do. The other step happens before that with respect to training and the training we provide to the officers that are involved in the, in the event. And we certainly have that scheduled. We discuss that. We talk about it. We highlight the fact that uh, when you deploy these items, even in a right situation or as part of a large-scale operation, that you have to understand that there's people around that were not involved in that. Uh, so that becomes a highlight in training. Okay. We do the warnings, and then in the applications, uh, as the officers are uh, working the, the, the operation, then uh, we reinforce that on the ground uh, tactically. And are the warnings with a bullhorn or just, uh, what do the warnings look like when you're trying to warn people to clear out an, of an area? We'll use whatever loudest device we have available. Last year we used cars, uh, mm -hmm. so we used the uh, public address system in the vehicles, which, which was quite loud. Okay, and it's my understanding that you're working with the Compliance and Professional Standards Bureau. We sort of have uh, the force investigation team sort of on hand for, I guess, advice in real live feedback as we continue, is that sort of what we anticipate in um, that section of your report? It says, we are working with the Compliance and Professional Standards Bureau to ensure the appropriate level of force investigation team members are readily available during the May Day event to address use of force issues that might arise. So I sort of read that to say is that we have people willing to give feedback on the spot, so to speak, but maybe I'm over. Well, not only that, but they, uh, under the settlement agreement, they have to investigate those right then and there. So it is better to have those folks present than to take someone offline to then stay back to address those use of force issues uh, to be in compliance with the settlement agreement. Okay. We've been joined by council, with council member Sally Backshaw. Thank you. So, so Barbara, uh, uh, will you just introduce your responsibilities to the city and sort of tell us through your role in Mayday preparations, if you will? Um, happy to. So again, Barb Graff, Director for the Office of Emergency Management. Um, we're the agency that in preparation for any type of multi-jurisdiction or multi-department or jurisdictional planned event or spontaneous natural disaster, for instance, we activate the city's emergency operations center. Um, it makes it more convenient to have representatives from police, fire, human services, uh, FAS, and others all together just in case something is needed. And so we will occasionally do that for um, events that we don't really anticipate a real busy time for us, but just to stand up and be in logistical support of whoever's lead in the field. In this case, um, uh, Captain Fowler as incident commander is who we, we take our, we're paying close attention to him and he's, he's, uh, he's got our ear. Very good. And uh, can you uh, describe what a, 
I, I guess they're colloquially called flash bombs. Is there a, um, another term used for the, the, the flash device or whatever it's called? Um, no. Yeah, flash those are the, the so, rubber. Um, so, so, so just, I, I, they've been called different items. The, so can you describe are. what that is, uh, when they are to be used, what the safety risks pose when they are used? And again, I, I, I want the city to understand we openly talk about strategies and what we use, it's all paid for by tax dollars, but there's also misinformation there. Sure. So I think this would be a good opportunity maybe to describe um, what that's about. Sure. And uh, what it's called, by the way. So. And, <laughs> and now that you've asked me, I'm trying to remember. The word flash uh, is in there. So. There's uh, sting balls, but those are the ones that, that actually have little, um, have items inside it. So there's three different kinds. There's ones that we call inert. And what they are is they're rubberized, um, projectiles that you you throw up in the air and they're designed to um, come apart with a loud bang uh, with minimal amount of this rubber dropping off of them. So there's three different kinds. We really use the inert kind. Uh, there's also ones that have a small amount of OC, so it spreads OC out over the head of a, of a riot. And then there's also ones that have uh, small pellets um, and, and we don't use those, or we're not using those necessarily for May Day. Um, but what they do is they can enhance the attention of, of the crowd on trying to get them to disperse. So again, that's one of those items that's controlled at my level in a riot situation. Individual officers are not allowed to deploy those without a, a command from me or the chain of command, uh, even in cases of personal uses of force, unlike OC. So that's very tightly controlled munition to um, help us move a crowd and get them back to uh, a non-riot, uh, stable situation. Okay. And I think the term flash grenades is generically used. Sometimes I've heard people it, refer to them it, as that. It may be, yeah. So, um, and so just to make it clear that the use of uh, this device in the three different types, but uh, particularly the inert and the one that so many so see, the force... Uh, investigation team, our uh, professional standards bureau, they are aware that this is one of the tools that uh, sometimes are needed in situations. And uh, as I understand it, that the decision to deploy that kind of uh, item is made at the IC level, the incident commander okay. level. That's correct. Okay. Um, any other questions from just my a, colleagues, please? Just a quick one. In your letter to us, Chief, make reference to the recommendations made in the Hillman report, and my memory is foggy. I can't recall. <laughs> Brad, that, could you I think refresh it? report was after the 2012 incident, mm -hmm. okay. incident. And so that's what came out after that Yes, incident. yes. So, and so we're following up on those recommendations. Right. We, and we've incorporated, health. in fact, uh, Chief, I mean, uh, Captain Fowler was the incident commander, if you recall, in 2013. And some of those recommendations was incorporated then, and they are used again so. this time. Yeah. And my recollection is things were um, less chaotic yes. in 2013 than they were the year prior. Yes, Councilmember, we were able to respond to the riot um, in a planned, in organized fashion. We will follow the same plans or something similar this year. Yes. So. Um, just for the viewing public, we actually started discussions on May Day preparation in February and March. There's actually been, there were actually news media that were asking about our preparation in January and February. Uh, we've been we've looked at the reports, we've looked at all the compilation of documents offline. Uh, I get the impression that we are ready as a city. I, I think you're assuring the council that we are. We, we don't expect perfection. We just expect to strive toward perfection, is what yes. I always say. <laughs> and in all seriousness, uh, we do realize that people have a right to protest in March. We encourage that and support that. But anarchists uh, that are trying to harm people and property, uh, we have to be aggressive there and constitutional at the same time. So I'm very confident that you, we've learned from lessons past and we're ready to ready for May Day. So. Thank you. Um, Thank, Thank you for you. being Thank willing you. to Thank answer all the questions. Sure. Thank you. Okay. Yeah.